Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Steinwald. Welcome to the second lecture as part of the Minnesota Dance and the Ecstasies of Influences series. Um, this one specifically is about legendary spaces, and you'll hear a lot about how Minneapolis dancers and choreographers have used every available space in the Twin Cities and beyond to find homes and community spaces and performance venues for dance. Uh, there's stories about gentrification, fires, um, and uh, real estate um, boom. So you, you'll get to hear a lot about the people that have made these spaces possible and how it uh, it really has grown into the community and the spaces we have today. Um, you see here some posters, some historic posters from the university archives. And the series has been developed in partnership with Judith Bryn Ingber, Linda Shapiro, Nancy Mason Hauser, and Cecily Marcus. And just um, today we can talk about a new partnership with the with the archives, and I have Kate here to talk a little bit about that before we get started. Hello, my name is Kate Huida, and I am the assistant archivist for the Performing Arts Archives at the U of M. Um, I'm here on behalf of Cecily Marcus, who is the curator of the Performing Arts Collections. She is at home today with a feverish little one. She regrets not being able to be here, but we are both thrilled about this partnership and are very excited to be able to share just a small sampling of what we have in our repository. We have, as of Friday, we had 134 collections from music, theater, and dance, all centered around activity in the Twin Cities and the Upper Midwest. Our collections are free to access and open to the public. Can you tell us where this performing arts library is located? Yeah, we are squirreled away on the West Bank at the Elmer L. Anderson Library, the very northern part of the West Bank. Uh, if you have any questions about the archives, our collections, our repository, our facility, which is amazing and open to tours as well, please come see me after the talk. I'd be happy to speak with you. Thank you. So we've been digging around in the archives and learning more about our community through those objects. Um, Two quick notes. One is there's place to sit on either side. There's also a chair in the middle here. Um, we are videotaping for uh, our archive and putting that up on YouTube. If you somehow feel uncomfortable being part of the conversation or being viewed, if you s hang out behind the camera, then nobody will ever see you. Um, and then, I was gonna say something really smart. Now I can't remember. <gasps> I got nervous. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna show you some videos just to get us in the mood. And I'm sure many of you have seen the video of the move of the Schubert Theater, which is now um, the Goodale Theater, when it got moved down the block. So you can find that on the Cole Center's website. It's you know a fun little video. But here are some videos just to get us going for today. I thought I could do this on my own, but I'm <laughs> not even going to pretend. The, the program, ma the making of new work and that right. sort of thing, which was a wonderful thing. And one of the things that allowed me to do is bring the choreographers uh, or the theater person or right. whoever to come to Minneapolis ahead of time, uh, maybe oh. a couple of months before, oh. you know, we did things on a short leash, sure. um, and look all over oh. to, and, and pick their spaces. Oh and pick what they wanted to do and meet some people before. So for example, one of the things I'm proudest of was we were doing, um, uh, we, I think the first Twyla Tharp residency, she was going to do the 100s and she needed to train 100 people in the community. Right. Yes. And 
so I took her uh, all day. You know, she's impossible. We went everywhere, and she didn't like anything. And then we went to the old firehouse, which is now the Firehouse Theater, which was an abandoned firehouse. It had a, a hearse or an ambulance inside of it. It was filthy. It was a mess, but it was owned, owned by a woman named Gloria Siegel, yeah. who was a, on the city council either then or later. And she was going to make it into a Chinese restaurant, I think. Right. It was going to be, and it, the university had really just been in the process of expanding over to the West Bank. So I called her and said, can we have it? I mean, Minneapolis was like that. Right. I called Negley Outdoor and said, can we have billboards for Merce? And they right. said, OK, you know, and so we had billboards. Right. I mean, we were just, it, people were so, Open, people were open and uh, and not afraid of anything. So we did um, for for Twyla, which is now what you're asking about. But we opened. They cleaned it up for us, yeah. fixed the locks on the door, gave us the key, and then when when uh, Jack Ruler, who yeah, I'm right. actually distantly related to, came to sh from Chicago, yeah. uh, I said, "Go get it before yeah. they turn it into a Chinese restaurant." I was really proud and of that. It's now Patrick's Cabaret. Oh, it is. Yeah, Patrick has moved his space to the old. Patrick, uh, was, that was not one of Patrick's spaces. You will hear all about Patrick's spaces, um, but Philip was mistaken. Um, it's a different firehouse that Patrick's Cabaret is now at. Uh, so that was Sue Wilde talking, and she was um, the original curator for performing arts at the Walker Art Center, although that was not her title. Um, at the time, but it gives you a sense of kind of this, the resourcefulness or scrappiness of finding spaces and converting them for a dance. Um, and then the next video we're going to show is a section <laughs> from um, the Oral History Project, and it has uh, Heidi Jasmine talking about some of the early Hauser spaces around um, the Twin Cities. and. It's booting up, okay. Um, I'm just gonna smile. Uh, see, this is why I didn't wanna do it. Um, so yeah, we have, again, one more seat right here and some lovely places to sit over there and Later became Caravan. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah, that's, that's right. This is about all the whole history, so yeah. yeah. And she was actually sharing a space before that space on the corner of Pryor, and there's another street about St. Anthony, I think. It was called Woodruff Halls. And it was this beautiful studio, huge, no posts, and two, two smaller spaces. And it used to be a dance, like a place for people to go dance, I think. And she, she shared a space with a, a ballet teacher there, whose name was Maria Farah. And they had their own students, but sometimes there was a little cross-mingling there. And they, they would put together performances, even. And that was only... Two years, that place burned down. And she and my brother, Mike, happened to be driving down. It was during Christmas break. And the fire was happening in that building. And they managed to somehow talk the fire department into letting them go up and save the drums and some photos. Oh. And <laughs> oh. I know. And, it was, and they were just starting to build because they both had their own students. And it was just and after two years, they were really, people were coming and studying. And it was so beautiful. Then they went to the university on, on University Avenue near the U. It was the, the old YMCA, and they taught classes down in the basement for a year or so. Then Nancy and Maria, I think, moved to California or something, and Nancy found this space on Prior An Avenue, which you're talking about, that dance caravan had after we were there. They were there for maybe six or seven years, and the landlord, Charlie McCarty, put a wood floor down and blah, blah, blah. And, he, and I'm not going to go into his history, but there's a history there. <laughs> and it was an old church. It was an old church. It was yeah. called the Church of God, you know, and it was an old wood frame church, and it was a big space, and then down the basement, changing rooms and stuff. And we would have informal performances there. There's so many eras. All these decades I have a little bit of difficulty keeping straight because we had a lot of different groups over that period, but that was mm -hmm. a solid group back then that... And Alan Iverson 
who was one of the only male dancers in town that at that point that wanted to do modern dance. He had been in New York and had, had done dance there and he hadn't been exposed to that, that much modern dance, but he was from here. He had studied some with the Andahazis before going to New York and then coming here and he had basically given up dance. He saw Nancy's concert somewhere that we did maybe at the Crawford Livingston or I don't know where it was, but and he came and started taking classes. And he was just this great dancer, wonderful dancer, and great guy. And um, so we got into performing more. Mm -hmm. And we were outgrowing that space. It was really, we tried to get another big big space on Raymond Avenue after that, after we had to leave that space because we needed more space. And the neighborhood fought against it because dance, we don't want dance in our neighborhood. Huh. They got a petition and, and my I think, I think Mike and Nancy went and fought it at City Hall downtown St. Paul. and. They signed a petition, we don't want music and dance, because we were going to be able to have music there too, in that neighborhood, you know, so, and it was a big old Masonic hall, you know, you know, the plight of dancers finding space. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, but so, then, you found then the we Guild. found the Guild on the West Bank on Cedar Avenue, yeah. which was right across from the university. There weren't any West Bank buildings then, I don't think. But that's when, you know, that's when things started to blossom. We moved there in 68. That was the beginning of a whole era, the late 60s and 70s. Yeah. And the rent was very, very cheap at the time. And we had two floors. We converted the downstairs into a small performing space. Maybe 90 people could sit there and watch. Had a post in the middle, which we almost not figuratively but we took that on the road because it was always in our choreography that empty space <laughs> it was like one time we wanted to take a big post and stick it out on the floor <laughs> and then up upstairs above the theater we had the dance studio where most of the classes took place and it had been an old knitting mill yeah. and the wood floors upstairs were just perfect and it was from the oil from the knitting machines oh. it was like satin you know, I and yeah, it was like satin, and it was just a beautiful. It felt springy at the time. Maybe I was young and didn't notice, but you know, it was a beautiful space. And then the whole idea was that at that time again they didn't have the nonprofit, so five of them put each put in two thousand dollars to go into that space. My brother Mike, the flamenco guitarist, and my mother, and a doctor that they knew, and Jeff Van, who was a classical guitarist, and one other person, and that's how we went in there. And it just right away, although actually a year before she moved to the West Bank, she was renting space at Dania Hall. Dania Hall was this old historical building where it was a Swedish community and it was a community organization and there was a beautiful space up there. She went to teach twice a week there because she was outgrowing this thing in St. Paul. And she, this was before they had known that they were going to have to fight the city. But she said, in the meantime, I'm going to start teaching classes in, Saint, in Minneapolis. So she rented that space for a year, I think, just twice a week. And when they went over to the Guild, that was in 68, and we were there until 81. Mm -hmm. And the Guild developed out of this feeling because it was so much space. You know, what else can we do here? But also Nancy's concern for music and all of the arts. Yeah. So for a while there, we had a music school that my brother ran, mm -hmm. and then we had an art gallery too, where people could just come in and put their work up. And then we rent the Nancy didn't want to rent to theater groups because she knew how sometimes they can take over with all their sets and their props and their this and their that, and she knew it might be a conflict with rehearsal space and time. But we did rent to some pretty wild, a couple wild theater companies. <laughs> And that was, that was fine that they were wild. That wasn't the problem, <laughs> you know. So we're going to join our, our speakers, our first four speakers. We have four official um, early speakers and four more contemporary speakers. So we'll go through eight speakers. And then really the format of today is that we all add our history and our memories to spaces and communities that have kind of taken over um, locations in the dance community. And so what you see now is um, Kristen Van Loon mapping furiously. Um, we could also add uh, the ballroom above Birch Pharmacy to the Hauser uh, lineage of spaces. I don't know what 
you know, happen between those, but I'm sure you all have memories of those performances and classes that happened um, with Nancy and Heidi. And then the first of the series, we, uh, Kristen made a map, and that was the history of contact improvisation in the Twin Cities, and so that was the, what the map ends up looking like. So you can look at that later. Um, so just as a reference of, um, of what is happening here. And because of the complexity in this round, we're going pencil first. So there are multiple layers. We've, we've uh, really kind of added um, the connectivity and also just listening to Heidi talk about the collaboration that happens in the dance community. So there's lots of blurry lines. So our first four speakers, um, I've got Judith Bryn Ingber, Marius Andahazi, John Linerson and Patrick Scully, if you guys want to come up and tell us your stories. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of you coming. What's an event without people at the event? Um, we thank Lynn, who's standing at the back, who is give a wave. Some people might not know you. He's head of the Coles. And we thank Michelle for putting all this together. I feel like I'm the oldest here, so I get to tell you that I have very old memories. And one of them, um, actually, I found in a book. And <laughs> since I love books, I'm going to pass this around, dance books particularly. But um, the park by Lake Harriet was a favorite place for dance in the turn of the century, the 18, late 1800s. And public schools would have dance events, and everybody, for example, on May Day would meet there to do their dances together. And it is recorded in an amazing book by uh, Linda Tomko, who wrote about dance classes. And you might like to look that up. And then I happened to be at the um, book part of Walker Art Center and found an extraordinary book, The Biggest Dance, A Miracle on Concrete. It fits right in, and Lisa might, I don't know how many of you participated, but um, the first dancer to lead off a world book of Guinness records was Bob Moulton, and um, he was our forever amazing official first dance teacher at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Theater when it was just theater. But um, a very interesting woman who maybe you studied with named Beth Obermeyer taught tap for MDT and she staged the World Guinness Book of Records tappers on Hennepin in 1979 before there was such a thing as a flash mob and um, there were uh, apparently 1,801 tap dancers, and that was one of the big um, markers for the opening of this building, Hennepin Center. So I marked Bob Moulton, and I marked um, the tappers, and Patrick is going to speak, and you'll see a window of his studio at the top on Hennepin. But besides the Lake Harriet and the Lake Harriet bandstand, Gertrude Lippincott had a studio downtown. She had danced in, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's me from the first Walker um, choreographer's evening in 1971. <laughs> That's when I told Suzanne Weil, who you said, um, walkers shouldn't just be for dancers outside. Young dancers have no theater space. And she gave me the, um, at 7 o'clock on a th uh, particular day in November, that we could, it might not have been November, now it's at Thanksgiving. And 7 o'clock, nobody would come at 7, right? And it was so mobbed for a free concert to see choreographers who weren't part of MDT or Choreogram or Anda Hasi or Nancy Hauser. I had gone around, you know, with my hubris and um, found them. Children's Theater also was represented. And so she asked if we would all perform again at 9 since people couldn't 
come in. It were, there were too many people. So I asked the dancers and everybody said, sure. So that's why the choreographer's evenings are always at seven and nine. And they're always full. But I wanted to mention Gertrude Lippincott. She started out um, in 1938 at the famous summer of Bennington uh, for modern dance, came back here where she grew up and had the first modern dance company. And her place was somewhere around here, and i sorry, don't know where. But talk about male dancers. She was quite infatuated with the butcher in DeWitt. It was a grocery on Hennepin Avenue, and she convinced him to join her as a dancer in her company. Um, the 40s, she used the Festival of Nations as a place for her group to perform. She was stationed at the Women's Y, the old building. They had a theater, and she performed in quite a lot of colleges, including Scott Hall at the University of Minnesota. Anybody see dance at Scott Hall? That was the usual place for dance when I was um, very little. So we're talking about the 40s. That would have been a usual place for dance as um, well as McAllister, and she performed there. By the 50s, you'll hear from Marius about the Andahasis at Northrop with the symphony, but if you couldn't go to New York to see musicals, where you would go for a very fancy dinner at Sheik's was to see Glenn Snyder's women's performers do the musicals that were on Broadway. So if you were really having a fancy night out, that's what you would do. Now, Glenn Snyder's papers are amongst those at the Performing Arts Library. He, his wife had been probably a rockette, but don't quote me. She was the main person, and she studied with a rival to your parents. Not a rival. <laughs> they, they weren't a rival. Forget that. Uh, Victor Stengel. Had anybody study with Victor Stengel? Did you really? So you went down to his, the, his studio on Hennepin in about 9th. <laughs> yes, I thought he couldn't possibly be good because one of my friends had very big calves, so he must not have, never mind. Victor Stengel was one of the ballet Russe teachers that landed here for quite a time. And um, Moulton, Robert, who did oleos for the showboat, you might remember, and did, he was a marvelous dancer. He and um, actually first choreographer from 1963 on for the New Guthrie Theater. He was their first choreographer. So Robert and a man that became eventually head of the whole Department of Theater Arts and Dance the very first year, named Wendell Josel had something called the stagecoach. Anybody go to the stagecoach? Oh, wonderful. What do you remember? They would do old musicals. West, yeah, it had a Western theme. It was a freestanding restaurant and theater it's before Chan Hassan. One minute left, that's all I've got here. Orcasus was a dance performing group at the university and um, people would go there to see it, besides Northrop. And I will now turn over to my very dear friend, Marius, talking about his, uh, his parents, and that's where I grew up. Thank you, Judith. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is, this is, hello. Uh, this is uh, really an honor to be invited here. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm excited to be able to share a little bit of the history of my parents. I tried to put together uh, a video uh, taking some of my oldest footage that I have from the f uh, 50s and uh, to try to put it in order with the spaces they were at. So most of the repertoire you see will relate to the building that it was rehearsed in or something like that. But one of the opening uh, events there is with Frederick Fennell 
conducting in 1964 uh, Scheherazade and Sylphide and Spectre de la Rose at the Northrop. And Judith uh, is in there somewhere in this. Um, but uh, one of the things is that uh, everything is in storage for me. Uh, so I literally have to crawl around and kick, you know, things over and try to get to it. So it's kind of a miracle to have anything here right now. Uh, we could actually start it, but I'll... I'll Say where your parents taught. Well, that's, that's what this... Uh, I, do you mean the space or... Yes, it's all there, I think. But don't blink because you might miss it. I have to do, there was sound for the beginning, but we can't understand it in this space, so I'll try to tell you where it is. So my parents uh, really brought their background of the Russian ballet, of the Russian ballet here. This is Aurora's wedding in the 50s that they staged at Northrop. Um, and uh, they had been dancers in the Colonel W. de Basile Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo from the 1933 through 41. And then uh, they settled here in the Twin Cities after World, uh, did I say World War I? World War II. Uh, numbers weren't my favorite thing in school. Uh, uh, that is the dying swan with my mother. One of the things that was very important is that they uh, didn't just do things from their ideas of the ballet that they were in. They collaborated with the top people in the world, like Yuri Klazowski, came and staged with them, Scheherazade and Petrushka, uh, many, many of the ballets, so they're very authoritative. Uh, now we're going to turn up the sound after his face shows. That's my dad in, in The Golden Slave. Do you know what that's like to be in school and say, this is my dad? Started to teach. That's where the studio was, downtown St. Paul. This is the one everybody knows on Grand Avenue in St. Paul. This is Frederick Fennell conducting in 1964. Uh, actually, I made a mistake. Um, so that's mommy and daddy uh, uh, in Scheherazade. Uh, N not f uh, very early, yes. Um, so she was, my mother was famous for her arms, and Massine and Fokine uh, often spoke about her, and so I chose this. This is where she awaits the uh, golden slave coming out. That was home. That was like coming home from school, and that's how they were. Uh, this was, they added a, a Minneapolis studio in 1953 I think that was and some of the ballets rehearsed there there weren't a lot of ballets rehearsed there but this is Sleeping Beauty which was third act Aurora's Wedding it was called there's Jane Harrington Kyes that uh, worked for us many years wonder if you could turn up the volume just a little and then we relocated to Edina at St. Patrick's Church which uh, we were there about 10 years from uh, 63 to 73. This is George Sorich uh, in the Ballet Russe video. He worked with my parents. And this is uh, the original ballet is done in the Dina studio. Carmina Burana worked with Jack Barkla on the sets. It's my first girlfriend. <laughs> with the U of M Chorus Orchestra and Glee Club. That was 350 singers and 98 musicians that came out of the pit that weren't in, wasn't enough for me to put this down. Just 
before we roast him in the pit. Uh, the dinners were interesting at home. Uh, there he is. And then I, I'm kind of doing this in honor of Jane Arrington, who for so many years did leading roles. She was one of her mother's favorite dancers to teach uh, and stage things. Uh, so this is my mother's close to 200 performances of this ballet. So when venues were too expensive to bring that costs, those has kept us going. And uh, pardon, this is the St. Paul Cathedral. And uh, I'm being asked to restage it again, uh, which we haven't done it in, since 2002. This is our St. Louis Park studio where we moved uh, in 1973. And uh, we rehearsed Los Saces and prepared for our tours. We danced at Washington National Cathedral twice and National Presbyterian Church. And uh, this is a Spanish theme to the ballet. This is Petrushka that Yura Blazowski on the right danced with my parents in the St. Louis Park studio. We started to do a lot of our ballets. This is back in the St. Paul studio, which I kept going to its 48th year. Uh, there's Gabriela Comleva. This is after my parents passed away. This is where I have taught daily for 31 years now. So teach at the University of Wisconsin in the Falls for the last 17 years. That's a tour to Portugal. These are some repertoire. I at last counting, I have counted 52 and I store them all. I haven't lost any note. I have all the scores that I accept. So that is it. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so back here. If you come to this building, and especially through the hallway, you might see John. He never says very much, but we got him to talk for today. <laughs> oh, I twisted my arm. No, you didn't. <laughs> I should have said John Lennerson. Um, I um, got mixed up in all of this uh, uh, because of because of some women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first one was my sister, uh, and this was back in um, back in uh, well way back uh, uh, on the West Bank. Uh, we were over at the university, and she. Uh, Found, was working at Mama Rose's and found a space uh, that wasn't being used. And uh, she was very good at finding spaces. And uh, this was uh, a very small, uh, we used about half of the uh, Mama Rose's space, um, a 50 seat theater, about what, a 10 foot uh, wide stage. And uh, they, uh, it was uh, where I first met uh, dancers. Um, David Voss, uh, Lilia Partridge, and uh, and let's see. Uh, so uh, the next year they moved around the corner. They found another space. Uh, she found this space. Um, I think it might have been an old police station, and it had a garage on this one one side over here. Um, the um, uh, this. This was quite a bit bigger building, and it turned into, um, uh, let's see, this was the Moppet Players set, uh, uh, that she had set up at that time. And, no, and uh, the stage was over on this side, um, and over here was lobby area, and back, back was scene shop. Uh, I don't know if you can see 
there's a second page that kind of does a layout. Um, there were no floor plans back in those days. We just did things, so. But I tried to recreate it. And uh, so there was seating over here. They used benches. Um, um, and again, this is where the dancers came in. Uh, um, Lois uh, and her contemporary dancers did uh, Madeline's Christmas there and Shoe Fly Ply, I believe, and uh, then their first Nutcracker. Um, after being on the 16-foot stage, they moved the Nutcracker to the 72-foot stage at Northrop. Uh, quite a jump. Um, this had a second floor um, space, and it, it um, so it had uh, art classes here. It had a dance studio here, um, and actually Sage Coles put money into helping develop this space. And I had a little apartment back here. Uh, I tended the furnace uh, there, and I still am tending the furnace <laughs> over here. <laughs> so I didn't get very far. Uh, but I sure have had a lot of fun with these uh, uh, dance. Uh, uh, Lois uh, uh, really had a good uh, uh, sense for finding wonderful buildings. And this was uh, one of their first ones that they were in. It's in Dinky Town. It's uh, burned down, so it's not there anymore. But uh, it was a pole building and uh, um, Scottish Rite Temple, beautiful space, stained glass windows. Um, it, um, I built a little uh, room up in here, so I lived there for a few years. <laughs> so <laughs> haven't gotten very far away. Uh, they. Uh, after this space, they moved uh, down to um, uh, University and Central. Uh, it was called the Fenneman Building there. Now we know it as the Aveda Building. Uh, Horst, uh, Horst uh, played in there a lot and really uh, made that into a fun building. Uh, when we were there, it had been um, the public schools had used it as a place where you if you uh, either go there or you go to jail, kind of, uh, I don't know what they call those, um, uh, kind of alternative school, <laughs> right? And they had really kind of messed the space up, it was, but it was wonderful space. Uh, 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 it had more, more character than even Hennepin Center does. Um, in um, 79, we found, or well, was about 76, we found this building and um, we rented it from Frank Sherman, uh, a couple of spaces on the second floor, now the, uh, the tech box space, and then we expanded in the back studio and up into the sixth floor. We started that when the uh, Hennepin Center uh, was created. Uh, Caroline McKay and, uh, and Millicent Charles were uh, the big women uh, 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 forces behind making this happen. Uh, the Cricket Theater was the, uh, uh, found their space up on the eighth floor. Minnesota Dance Theater had uh, um, what, five, six studios in uh, about 30,000 square feet. So we, we had a good chunk of the building. There were small spaces around that had offices and then there was the little theater that was on second floor. Um, this, um, one of the ideas behind Hennepin Center was, uh, other than uh, to provide this performing space and rehearsal space, was that it was to be supported by the restaurants. You know, the first, the first floor, Green Mill went in the basement, uh, Ichabod's went into the first floor, and uh, restaurant business is probably as hard as dance business. Uh, <laughs> Because they never really, ha it never really has been the uh, cash cow for the place, and uh, I don't know. We keep hoping, but um, uh, in actual fact, the uh, dance company has been the uh, real solid backbone of the place. This, uh, the Masons build wonderful spaces for arts, and this one had some had a lot of variety it's got that office space on on Hennepin Avenue and then uh, all the big uh, uh, lodge spaces on the inside uh, that we converted into wonderful studios by the time we got here we had had a lot of practice building studios and so uh, 
uh, we uh, some of these turned out pretty nice. There's a, there, and it's uh, one of the keys that makes that so solid. One of the other things that's interesting about this building is it's got that center elevator core where you really see and feel all the energy of the different people. Um, it's, uh, you just keep running into it uh, so much there. Uh, I work over at the Grain Belt building and it's so spread out, you know, you just don't see anybody, but here, you're, well, right now you're all, all in one elevator. <laughs> But it's, uh, uh, it is a treat to see the energy here. I mean, this was, you know, back in 79, we started, uh, they did the renovation and the, the big tap uh, uh, um, Guinness record. And uh, it's really worked quite well. And of course, it was one of the impetuses that, um, that brought the, uh, the Schubert Theater over here. Um, and it, it seemed like a wonderful idea to connect the performing space directly with uh, the rehearsal space so you could have that convenience of, uh, of being close by. Um, hopefully um, that will continue to grow and develop and be more of a, of, of a total marriage. Uh, um, it's... Um, it's... It's... It's great space they built over there, uh, over here, um, and it's wonderful space actually. But it it feels still a little separate from all the studio and the dance thing uh, ac activity it, uh, to me. Um, and uh, it would be fun too if the union would even let them um, somehow use the space uh, without. You know, we used to have something we called a work light rehearsal, uh, where they'd let us just be in there. You wouldn't touch anything, you wouldn't do any, you wouldn't use any work lights, any sound equipment. You would just use the space, because it's so wonderful for dancers to spend time in the space they're going to perform. You just, the, the tight squeeze of time with full union crew, and I have nothing against union crews, because I've worked with them for years, and they're wonderful. I've always made them a part of the show, and they need to live too, and they need to pay, get paid, and they have their rules that that regulate this crazy business we're in. I mean, it, it is crazy what we often ask for them. I know I've been through it, uh, and uh, but uh, I just wanted to throw that out uh, to you guys back there. <laughs> If it ever could happen, uh, why just to be able to to use it in a, a less structured way, because space is you you got to be in the space a lot. Okay. Uh, um, I forgot Doris Overby, and I just wanted to mention her because. Uh, She's another woman in my life that uh, really uh, saved Hennepin Center. Uh, you, many of you probably don't know her, but uh, you know, after four or five years, uh, when the leases start to expire, why uh, Ichabod's was moving out, and the Cricket Theater was uh, having trouble, and uh, MDT had grown larger than it could handle. Um, Doris was brought in, and. Uh, she really loved this building and really cared for it and, and took care of it. And, um, and so, yeah, I just want you to know that she's, she was a very important factor in the survival of Hennepin Center. It was Doris Overby. So John, thank you. Marius, thank you. Now I want to call on Patrick Scully, who has newer memories. But now we're called old. <laughs> so I took my first dance class in the spring quarter of 1972 in Norris Gymnasium for Women at the University of Minnesota. And Heidi Jasmine, who we saw earlier in the video, uh, was my first dance teacher. I soon migrated and was taking a lot of dance classes at the Guild of Performing Arts on the West Bank including in January of 1976, uh, Mary Cerny taught the first contact improvisation class at the Guild of Performing Arts. 
and uh, I was one of the students in that class. Uh, but Mary soon left town and headed to England, and so those of us who were doing contact improvisation, we were kind of left on our own, and we decided um, rather than locate ourselves at the Guild of Performing Arts, we were going to find our own space. So Joanne Tillemans and I uh, found a storefront space that was for rent at 2511 Bloomington Avenue. Uh, this building still exists. Today it's a Somali coffee shop, um, but it was a very simple one large room and a basement underneath it, about 900 square feet. Uh, the only problem was that our landlord really loved the idea of having dancers in the building, but somehow his idea of dance was maybe more like the Andahazis than it was um, classic, than it was contact improvisation. And so he was always complaining that you guys shake the building, and this is an old building, and the gas pipes are going to break, and the building is going to explode. His name was Hugo Scrastens, and um, we, he eventually tried to evict us. We go, went to conciliation court and won in our settlement against him, but we ended up leaving that building. When we left that building, uh, we moved into a building that we called Cityscape. Um, Mindy Melamed used to be an independent dancer and choreographer here in town, and Mindy had a studio in that building, and a guy named Randy, and I'm blanking on Randy's last name, was Mindy's next door neighbor in the studio space. Um, and Randy was an architect, and he decided, if I'm gonna be an architect, I need to like live in Cedar Riverside and understand contemporary modern architecture and less alternative stuff like warehouse living downtown. So Randy moved out, we took over his space, and um, Contact Works was then in that building, Palace Theater was in that building, Mindy was in that building, um, Kyle Staver, who was Gail Staver's sister, she was a sculptor, she was in that building, and we stayed in that building until Bob Andrews kicked us all out. Um, <laughs> and then a few years later, um, Xenon was able to move back in and into that space that had been contact work space. Um, and when we left that building, we um, found a space in the Harmony Building, which is on 2nd Avenue North and 3rd Street North. Um, that building is still there down uh, in the North Warehouse District, and Contact Works was in that space then from the late 70s into maybe about 81 or so. When I left Contact Works in 1980, I... Um, was working independently and was eager to have a space of my own to work in. And um, I found one of my all-time favorite spaces, which was on the next block here, um, at 626 Hennepin Avenue, above the Best Steakhouse and the porno store that was the next door neighbor to the Best Steakhouse. But I had, on the third floor of that building, I had 3,200 square feet of space, for $300 a month, including heat. Um, and, but the space had really lousy floors. The good news was the city was tearing down buildings near Lake and Nicollet because they had this bright idea that they should close off Nicollet and put in a Kmart and a grocery store. Um, and so they were gonna redevelop Lake and Nicollet. Um, and I found out that one of the buildings that they were gonna tear down had a ballroom on the third floor. So I called the city councilman, I think his name was Mark Kaplan, called Mark Kaplan's office. Turned out Mark Kaplan's secretary, as a young woman, used to go to dances in the ballroom. And so she so loved the idea that dancers were interested in salvaging the ballroom floor from her ballroom that she pulled the strings that was necessary to get us keys to the building so that we could get a volunteer crew with crowbars in there and pry up all the individual floorboards and haul them from Nicollet and Lake to 7th and Hennepin and hoist them up the fire escape in the back and relay the hardwood floors. As a task, it was comparable to tearing down and rebuilding the pyramids. It was like the most labor-intensive thing I probably ever did. Um, but as a result, I learned a lot about building dance floors. And, um, 
and the we had two studios in that building and the one with the best dance floor in that building it was the kind of floor where you could you'd see somebody walk across it and you could see the floor sort of respond to their footsteps underneath it and i made the choice of using oil instead of um polyurethane to finish the floors which is a little more labor intensive for keeping the floors up but it's really nice as a dancer to have like bare feet on a well-oiled floor um this nothing compares to the kind of sensuousness of that texture to dance on um that building was there until the city and all of its wisdom decided that block east should be torn down and um, the monstrosity built that is there now um but the next space, and there are many spaces that have been part of my, but I'm mo mainly I'm going to only talk about spaces that I had some control over. So there's the Bloomington Avenue space, the cityscape space, the Harmony Building space, um, then the space here on 7th and Hennepin. Um, the next space I didn't have direct control over, but I did a barter at St. Stephen's School at 22nd and Clinton, South Minneapolis. Um, and I basically went to the principal and said, look, you don't have any money to pay artists to teach, and I don't have any money to pay for rehearsal space, but I've got teaching ability and you've got unused space. So how about we do an exchange? You give me keys to the building in exchange, I'll teach you know, X number of hours a week um, creative movement to the students here at St. Stephen's School, and I had keys to this probably 5,000 square foot gymnasium with an old fashioned wooden floor, cavernous space, but wonderful space to move in. And that space became actually the original home then to Patrick's Cabaret. Sometimes you may hear histories of Patrick's Cabaret that say it was started in the church basement at St. Stephen's Church. That's a lie, it was in the school gym um, in St. Stephen's School back in the days when it was a parish school. We could only do the shows there on Friday nights because there was always a contra dance group that had dances in the space on Saturday nights. And so when in the mid-1980s I got a storefront space just across the freeway on 24th Street between Portland and the 35W freeway wall, um, shortly after that, I think it would have been then May of 1989, Patrick's Cabaret started happening in the storefront space, which was also my apartment. And uh, it was very intimate for me. I was even more at home in my own apartment than I was in the school gym where I was usually teaching creative movement and delighted to be able to welcome people to see a show and um, be in my home. Um, at the same time, the space was frequently used by people who were looking for rehearsal space, many um, independent dancers and occasionally theater people. And then in the sometime 1996, I'm guessing, um, the city and its wisdom decide, discovered that we didn't have a theater license. And if you can't have a theater in a building that you don't have a theater license for, and you can't have a theater license, you can't get a theater license in a building that's zoned residential. Um, there's a whole long history there. But the good news is we ended up finding an even better building. Um, so we left that building where um, open, uh, open Eye Figure Theater is today. We left that building and moved to the fire station next to the police station at Lake in Minnehaha in South Minneapolis. And at the time when the fairy godmother asked me what kind of lease we wanted, I tried to be as visionary as possible and I said I wanted a 20 year lease at a dollar a month. And she consented and I realize now that I should have asked for a 100 year lease at a dollar a month. Um, but nonetheless, um, that was also a Herculean task of building a new dance floor in that space. Um, but for the first time, I actually got to hire people to build a dance floor and I got to supervise the construction of it. Um, and those are the, that's the story of the seven dance spaces that I've had some degree of control over in town. Thank you.
All right, we're going to switch the panelists, and we've got uh, Myron Johnson, Paula Mann, Steve Busa, and Kristen Van Loon, who will kind of float between her note taking and uh, and talking. We can start. We'll do the same. Am I first? You are first. Okay. Um, I will do my best. I have been a lot of spaces. And I actually took notes and then left them. So I will do my best. The, the thing that sticks out to me about spaces and dance in Minneapolis is how we danced anywhere we could. We, any, any space that had 12 by 12 had a ballet going on <laughs> in it. Um, I'm going to start way back when I was three. I went to nursery school in a building for two years. I went to first grade. I was walking to my grandma's house, and on the sidewalk were purple dinosaur footprints that went to the door of my old nursery school. So I followed a man, seven years old, apparently interested, walked in, there was no one in there, and down the stairs came a beautiful blonde woman who turned out to be John Linerson's sister, who said they were having tryouts. And I didn't know what that meant. And she said, can you go up on that little platform and be a weeping willow? And I said, yes. <laughs> and I remember exactly what I did. And she said, would you like to be in a play? And I said, yes. And I was there for 25 years. <laughs> and that space went from that old firehouse station across from Mama Rosa's to the Art Institute, where we danced in. Lisa and I danced in the Chinese Gallery, where the, Minnesota, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts actually let us dance in the galleries of the museum all the time with rosin, mirrors, we laid on things, used a crypt, a Chinese crypt as a ballet bar. <laughs> and Frank McGovern would put um, cigarettes out in it. <laughs> because lest we forget, we all smoked then while we taught, while we danced. <laughs> then um, the, from the Art Institute, the Children's Theater built their um, home, the, that big place. And um, I went to France on a scholarship to study with Marceau and uh, a guy named Peter Goss who was teaching um, ballet jazz, which was really awesome, I thought. So I came back to Minneapolis and that's what I wanted to do was dance. Um, I started doing Myron and Friends dancing, I think it was called, on the stage at Children's Theater. And then um, John got arrested and we all left town. <laughs> <laughs> and. I went to New York for a while. And when I came back from New York, I had started a company in New York called the Edge Dance Theater. Came back here and Mary Lear had opened Ruby's Cabaret on East Hennepin in the old funeral parlor. Tiny little space. The stage was eight feet deep by 12 feet across. And I did Beneath the Ballet of the Dolls, and people liked it. So we started a company called Ballet of the Dolls and moved into the Harmony Building and did performances on Monday nights for um, membership only because you, we didn't have a license or know how to get one. And um, then that took off, and Mary and I did the Big Rubies across the freeway on 3rd Avenue North, if anybody remembers that one. It was awesome. It was bringing dance into 
a restaurant bar setting where full menu, full bar, Mozart ballet, all going on at the same time. And in that first year, we danced 280 performances in one year. Then I burnt out, and we went to Loring Park in the Loring Playhouse, and we were there for a long time, seven, eight years maybe. Then we started hopping because we were looking for a space to be permanent because everywhere we went, Starbucks would move in and the rent would go up. So we decided we were good enough to have our own building. So we um, went to Marvin's Gardens on Central for a few years while we tried to locate a spot. Then we moved to the building on 18th and Central, that warehouse that's really great. They, it was um, spaces that you could drive a train into and lower bombs in, into the train during World War II. Big dance spaces, and we built a dance floor in there. It was like 80 by 140 or something like that. Um, me and one other person, as I recall. And then we um, found the Ritz. And then we raised the money for the Ritz. And then I did that. <laughs> and then I did that. And now um, the Ritz is there, and I hope people use it. It's a great space. I don't want to use it, but I hope that other people do. It's really a good space. Um, and in a nutshell, Along the way for Ballet of the Dolls, we also performed everywhere else. Um, O'Shaughnessy, Ordway, here, all over the place. But when we first met about this particular meeting, we talked about how amazing dancers are when it comes to making spaces for themselves. And I think by the end of this session, we'll realize that there's really no other arts group quite like dancers when it comes to spaces. They really will get in and work hard. So that's it. So I'm Paula Mann. Um, in 1989, uh, Xenon vacated a space that was on uh, 5th Avenue and 4th Street. It's now a parking uh, garage. Um, and that was the beginning of Space Space, which I really can't remember how we came up with that name. It just, I think someone was saying, what the hell are we going to call this? And Space Space was the simplest um, idea. But uh, so we started in the old Xenon space, and I don't know if anybody was at this fantastic New Year's Eve party in 1989 that we had anybody here remember, do you remember that? That was a crazy time. <laughs> but we found another space, and that was on 10th uh, Street, 609 South 10th Street. And the space was basically the second floor of a building. We had both front and back of the space. And uh, it was a f not a free span space, there was a pillar, and we had to have that moved. It was actually a support pillar, so I remember it being complicated, and the city um, uh, had to help us with that, which was great. They helped us move a pillar, and um, sending some pictures around, because the space was then a very beautiful free span space, lots of light, and um, kind of a bumpy floor, a little bit uneven, but, uh, but a really great space to work. So we used it as a rehearsal space. We eventually started renting the space out. Um, what we really did there was we produced a cabaret, which was, uh, you know, it was the 90s, so it, anything goes. You know, I, we had a lot of experimental work there. We, um, we tried to promote experimental work, dance, theater, music. Um, the cabaret was called Blah Blah Blah, and again, don't ask me where that name came from because I can't remember, but it was probably one of those weird conversations that Sean and George and I had. 
And uh, it, it was really a, a kind of a great community space, really. Um, we had a house band, Godwana, which was Drew Gordon's band. And um, it, was, it was just so much fun. Um, so it was used, that space was used. Uh, there was a back space, and that space was just a crazy conglomeration of storage. And I know there were squirrels that lived back there, and it was just, you know, all kinds of stuff. But, um, but it, that space was really used, and it was, it was well-loved, and um, uh, I miss it. But it, it produced a lot of cool, creative stuff. Um, and so we moved out, and then Kristen moved in and uh, used it for quite a while, right, Kristen? Yeah. So I think we moved out in 97 or 98, and um, Kristen moved in. And so now I don't know what its status is. Is it still in use? No dancing. No dancing. But, uh, but it was a great space, and it was really indicative of a time in Minneapolis that was very experimental, very fun, um, had a lot of great time there, so. Hi, my name is Steve Busen. I'm a co-founder and artistic director of Red Eye Theater. Um, and we're a little different in that we're a theater-based company performance. Uh, although very involved in dance, and that's why we opened that space to, to everyone in the performing arts. Our history started in 1983 in the North Loop end of downtown Minneapolis in the Weewa building. <clears throat> Weewa Art Building was one, I, as I understand, and some of my facts are anecdotal from what people have told me, and some I know are actual through dates that I've experienced myself. So. In 1983, we moved into this space in the Weewa building. It was a second floor uh, theater that was inhabited by, before us, Performers Ensemble, which had dissolved and had left, and we took over the lease. Uh, but I'm understanding it's the first art space building that was developed for, for arts and for artists in the, in the Twin Cities. And it was a fantastic building. And at that time in 1983 in the North Loop, there, there was tremendous activity. It had not been developed. The, the Washington Avenue neighbors of ours were across the street where Tension Envelope Company, which was still in operation, and right next door was Yoshiko's Massage Parlor. So it was not shishi. It was not ready to be developed, and it was not a, a sought-after area in that time. But tons of artistic activity going in, lots of open space and lots of artists cross um, cultivating and, and pollinating their works together. And that was the idea of Red Eye. So Red Eye wanted to be always a collaborative. It was in times when collaboration had a, a different kind of meaning, when it really was in terms of everybody informing everybody else's work. But in terms of making it, not in telling you what kind of work you should be making, but actually how do we sit down and have a conversation where the disciplines cross over together. And ours, of course, being theater, was really, really informed by dance, contemporary dance. And we, we were what I would call aggressively contemporary. So like, like Paula, when she talks about the experimental aspect, we were looking for works that were really speaking to what it meant to be alive today in a new way, with all due respect and, and admiration for, for the classical history of, of, of both theater and, and, um, and dance. But it was aggressively, aggressively contemporary. We were looking for works that were pushing the boundaries in whichever way that we could do. And we have two spaces in our history. One is that one on 127 North Washington, which is the North Loop. And the second is in the other, uh, the south part of downtown Minneapolis, which is where we are today, um, 15 West 14th Street. So it's at the far edge of the downtown mall. And, and again, um, the, the space on 127 North Washington was 66 seat theater. So you could try lots of things. You didn't have a commercial kind of, of risk that you had to take in order to perform in there, which was a fantastic liberation for many people. So you could go in there, you could do things that you could do without worrying how many people were going to come and, and uh, see the, the performances. 
uh, it was it was a space that filled us with with admiration for what was happening all across the Twin Cities, because we had so many people come through the doors, both as collaborators, but also as, as artists that we worked with. Some of the dance people from the community that we first came in contact with was Bill Heron, who had a dance company, Bill Heron Ballet, um, which, which I first saw at CTC and worked with him when John invited me to do a, a project there in a summer program, uh, Wendy Morris was the second one that, that really started to come in and inform our work and work with Red Eye. Diane Aldis was, was part of that space on 127 North Washington. Marjorie Frank Fragnoli was part of it. Uh, Maria Cheng, Tom Kentak, and David Means. And all those names really were, were important in our history and Red Eye's history in developing what it meant to be a collaborative and how you begin to collaborate with different disciplines in, in making work that, that no one has seen yet. Um, that, that came to an end with, and Patrick mentioned this in his, his talk, um, with the redevelopment of Block E. So when the city decided to move everything off of Block E to tear it down, they had to relocate some of the businesses that were that were in residence on Blocky. The one um, that had a notorious reputation was Moby Dick's Bar. Uh, and we, it just has a fantastic illustrative history. It was from the 40s on. It was, it was a really fabulous place of, of, uh, of bohemian life in, in the Twin Cities. Um, but in order to, to move them, they, they decided they were gonna move them into the Weewa building which means taking over this, the bottom floor. In order to do that, they had to evict the tenants that were in the Weewa building, which of course then meant red eye. So we got into a fight with the city about, about relocation and, and what it would mean. We fought with them and the, the outcome of the battle was that neither Moby Dix nor red eye was able to be in, have a home at, at that space. So they moved, we were successful in, in blocking Moby Dicks, but we were also successful in blocking our own kind of ability to stay there. Um, they, they, put, they put a fire code violation on us, which meant that every performance we had until we left to move to our new space had to be um, sat in with by a, by a fire marshal who watched us perform every piece, and whom we had to pay for, for doing that. We then got a, a lease at the, at the present space, 15 West 14th Street, which had been the rehearsal space for the, for the Cricket Theater, which had moved from, from the next door, or from the building next door, um, the eighth floor, to, to the Music Box Theater, which it is now. They had a rehearsal space and we were taking two pieces to New York and before we did that, we signed the lease that we would then come in to do that, that space as our home. And that's, and I, th I hope many of you have been there. I, I know many of the contemporary dancers here have been there for sure. We m took the tour, the two pieces to New York, came back, opened up that space in 1989. And it was, it was before us, it was a Fred Astaire dance studio. Um, and before that, it had been a, develop, uh, a photo processing development uh, studio, and before that, a used car. So we had to renovate the space. So as, as it stands now, it, the, the ceiling was down to about nine feet, which of course would not be doable for a performance space. We needed to, to excavate the ceiling. It was all done with, with volunteer labor. Um, and that's really where our, our really close connect with the dance community began in 1989 with, with sharing and inviting people into this space to, to be the space. We never wanted, or do we want to now, be a venue where people would rent the space. So often our, our productions are done as collaborations or as, as invites, co-sponsorships and co-presentations with, with dancers in the, uh, in the community who need a space to perform their, their, or develop their ideas. We consider ourselves a developmental venue. 
um, and again, pushing toward what, what people need in order to make work, what kind of space do they need, what kind of support systems they need, besides lots of time and lots of money. But we do offer time and space. So that's the brief history of Red Eye. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to have, talk about it. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm here talking about the Bryant Lake Bowl Cabaret Theater, um, but I'd love to just piggyback um, Paula's story that um, my dance company Hijack did the last co-production that Space Pace did, which was very wonderfully supported, full show. There were some coffee can lights in the uh, hanging from the pipes, and uh, I think we did the last show there in 98. And then it closed, and then there was this rumor that some artist kept bees in there, and we all wondered what it was. And then um, Arwen and I met that artist at a party, and uh, Jeff Milliken's a photographer and uh, related to Heidi Colwaite, the amazing dancer. And he said, because she said, oh, this is the old space space, he actually kept the whole dance, the, the best part of the floor, empty, and it was sitting there, so we... Um, arranged to share it with him as a rehearsal and secret performance space for um, another 10 years um, until a couple years ago. And then we got ousted. No more dancing there. It changed hands a bunch of times in that decade. <laughs> uh, I know that. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Hijack... Um, what do I want to say? No one has said the Southern Theater yet, so I just want to say the word Southern Theater because um, when we moved to town in 93, um, Ball's Cabaret was where we would often perform uh, midnight on Saturdays and uh, in, at the Southern Theater. And uh, that was basically our performance scene, open mic nights and shared evenings. And uh, also in 93, Kim Bartman opened the Bryant Lake Bowl Theater in the bowling alley at, uh, in the Lynn Lake neighborhood. Um, so we were jumping on an open mic nights there. There was a show called 2 AM, Live in the Hood, that we performed in, in uh, probably 94. And um, there was uh, conversations at the Blue Table, which was kind of a David Letterman style thing that Lee Combs did there that we performed in, and then um, we made a little press kit and made a little meeting with Danny Schmitz, who ran the theater, and he did pretty much a lot of like cabaret show tunes kind of stuff there with the resident company Hot Dish, and um, talked him into letting us do a dance concert at the Bryant Lake Ball Theater. So I have this like picture my dad took of me walking out on Lake Street, and in the windows it says, Hijacks, Take Me to Cuba, the first dance concert at the Bryant Lake Bowl. <laughs> um, so uh, we uh, fell in love with the theater. The, the physical space, it's an old um, uh, car garage, Ford car garage, um, where they repaired Model Ts in the 20s. And then it became a bowling alley in the 30s. And then the um, lanes, the current pin setters, were installed in the 50s. Um, and then Kim Bartman, who had a little coffee shop in Uptown called Cafe Weird, opened her second space uh, at the Bryant Lake Bowl. And that back room had been a like, pool hall video game um, place to buy drugs, I think, <laughs> and, and um, they cleaned it up a bit, and, and Kim and Danny Schmidt set it up uh, exactly how it looks now with a little raised stage, which is um, irregularly shaped, but a little bit bigger than 9 by 22, and uh, we can squeeze 85 seats in there, and uh, there's full food and bar service. Um, you could uh, smoke in that first decade uh, while watching shows. Um, and then the restaurant smoking ban for, Mini for Minneapolis was actually signed at the Bryant Lake Bowl whenever that happened. Um, and the back is, is the, the storefront windows, which um, get used quite often. 
Um, so it's, it's a square little space. It looks like it should just have show tunes on that upright piano, but um, it's kind of developed a, a reputation as a space where um, people are very tempted to um, dance out on Lake Street uh, with those windows open or uh, play with the five doors through which you can get in and out of the space. Um, so, uh, oh gosh, I brought my piles. Cause, oh, so uh, I'd been doing a lot of shows there as Hijack. We've done five full evenings and we've started um, asking our favorite artists from other cities to share shows with us. So it, it became this kind of um, grassroots touring spot. Um, and then uh, the previous artistic director uh, moved on and uh, Kim, who I knew socially, just based on the fact that I did dance shows there every once in a while, asked if I would run it. So I started running it 10 years ago. Um, but it is a space that, uh, you know, within one day, even though there's a lot of dance, there's also um, still, for sure, stand-up comedy and, <laughs> thank you my notes, um, and, uh, you know, science salons and documentary films and burlesque and kids shows and um, that everything, um, that there, and there are also a lot of, um, one thing I think that's special is it's a place where dance kind of, and, and, and forms kind of merge, so I see Linda Shapiro who did Dancers Who Write uh, series with Rebecca Frost there. Um, and Dykes Do Drag, which is a burlesque show that's been running over 15 years, was started by a group of modern dancers, including Heather Spear. Um, uh, da, 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 da. And then um, for 12 years, Lori Van Weeren has been running the mighty 9x22 Dance Lab, um, which is a monthly showcase um, for three choreographers in conversation about their work. And another regular programmer there for years and years was John Munger with his Rabbit Show, as well as December for several, I think three or four years in a row, he did his one man nutcracker, uh, Nutbuster, there. Um, Fringe Festival has flown, uh, flowed in and out of the Bryant Lake Bowl. Um, uh, and that's also, I think, a big part of uh, the traditions of, of dancers kind of being used to going everywhere and sharing spaces, continuing to, continuing the tradition of um, sharing spaces with other art disciplines. Oh, there's so many, lots of amazing um, concerts have happened there. People have really, um, because they know I'm a sucker for um, dance that messes with the space, they all uh, ask to do that. <laughs> a lot of people do that. So, you know, like body cartography has pre presented there a lot. Um, and we've also done a lot of exchanges, like with the Catch series in Brooklyn and mm, Link Vostok and a whole bunch of Russian choreographers. Um, Chris Yan, Morgan Thorson, Justin Leaf has done so many different kinds of shows there. In fact, he's doing three different kinds of shows next month, um, both as himself um, singing and as his alter ego, Mistress Ginger. Um, so not more flow with the dance world. Um. Thinking about spaces we didn't mention, uh, Studio 206, Sean McConnellog's studio now um, in the Ivy Arts Building. Are there others that? 6A. 6A. Okay, wait, slow down. Do you want to come up and talk for a little bit? Okay, wait, wait till the microphone gets to your lips. Here we go. I was actually thinking first about the Southern, because I was first there in 76, 76. Um, Jeff had just kind of moved in and thrown some bleachers up and offered to sponsor a dance company, so Ozone Dance Company performed there. But I remember most is that the Hilton was not, was it the Hilton that's there now, the Radisson, was not there. So the only crossovers were we'd have our really, to us, expensive jazz shoes, and we kept Big Wellingtons outside because we performed in January, February a lot. 
got into our big wellies and ran around the building, <laughs> left them on that side, and then came in. So we had to always, you know, choreograph the crossovers so that you had shoes on the other end to run around. <laughs> and then later, Ozone, um, uh, Theater in the Round was kind of a hidden gem that helped a lot of people out. We rehearsed there during the day because they only did evening, sh evening rehearsals and shows. But there were no lights other than two bare light bulbs, so it was very much sort of a sensory deprivation chamber for creating dances. And the Wyman is what I th flashed on too, when Steve was talking about Weewa, Wyman building was where a lot of the, or Ozone Dance Company moved in with two studios there. When the company dissolved, Linda Andrews moved in with Xenon. But the Minnesota Independent Choreographers Alliance had offices there. So that's where we would go, sit in the big studio in a big, hall, big circle. Um, and again, we, a lot of crisscross of people. But one of the cool things about like with Weewa and Wyman Building is there were so many other artists around, particularly Ann Marston was around, um, Gus Gustafson. So there was a lot of mix, particularly of visual arts. Uh, David Critchlet Studios was across the street. The New French was active. I remember Ann Marston teaching me how to jimmy how to jimmy the parking meters so you could, rather than pay 25 cents for four hours, you could park for free. <laughs> and uh, so I still come downtown kind of assuming and expecting there should be a parking spot for me somewhere because it was never a problem at the beginning. But yeah, it's made me think about some spaces that did not continue on or became quickly absorbed and changed into other things. And then Linda made, peace, made work for us at Wyman Building and performed there as well too. Yeah, and I don't even know what's in that space now, at all. Right, right, yeah. But what happened? So this is Diane Aldis, and now we're going to say your name. Gymnastic teacher who taught us to very carefully lean over and do somersaults. Oh, except for Patrick Scully, who had like. Six four hundred and thirty seven feet tall, wanted to do back somersaults every class with me spotting him. <laughs> but the opening of the fourth floor oh, yeah. came on the heels, and remember, this was the days before aerobic classes. Everybody was doing dance classes. It came on the heels of virtually a sold out Northrop performance. Studio opened, the teachers, the dancers put so much sweat equity into putting up the beautiful mirrors refinishing the floors. It was a huge event opening day when the Pilots Club Band performed <laughs> with like a 400 pound chain that they were whipping around. And, <laughs> we had to adjust the choreography. <laughs> and we were all like, oh my God, not the floor. Oh my God, not the mirrors. <laughs> but that, that started that whole space off. Yeah, that's right. I remember that now. <laughs> it was great fun. Thank you. Linda, Lee, do you want to come up and tell some stories? I'm Lee Dillard, and uh, when I was dancing with Nancy Hauser, we had a second studio um, in the New French Cafe building. And then, uh, of course, the arts gallery that went in there, um, or framing shop went in there, we got kicked out of that. And then when I was dancing with, Nance, uh, with Margie Farnioli, she found, um, I guess back where Target Field is now, um, an abandoned medical supply building, and it was like vacant, and we would go, no heat, and there were still old supplies and stuff, but Will Swanson and um, Nancy Duncan, who moved on to New York, um, and um, Becky Heist, um, and we would work there. It was really nasty, um, but there were, you know, sort of all sorts of things. And then Margie, um, I think the building got contempt, condemned and knocked down, and then we moved to some storefront uh, uh, on Broadway in uh, North Minneapolis, and we had to lay, it was a, like a clothing store, and there was hideous carpet, and so we lay cardboard on top of the, the carpet so we would have a flat surface to dance on. So um, that was really fun too. David, you wanna Just tell some place. stories? Yeah, no, well come up here and tell some stories though. Well, I don't know about stories. I just remember going, you know, twice or more in the 90s or before or after. People Center, has that ever hosted dance or is that mostly small theater? 
People's Center is it's now used for dance for the for the U. I don't know if it's been a presenting space or not. Um, Margolis Brown, does anybody remember when they had a church that was east of the second space space space? Yeah, and that used that ran for two or three years. Yeah, it it was a church that was practically falling in. Yeah. Yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah. But they couldn't afford it. Old Arizona is still operating today at the southern end of uh, Nicolet. Yeah. Open Eye Figure Theater is hosting dance from time to time. Playwright Center, do they host dance? They have in the past. Fringe? Off leash? Concordia College was the home for someone who's passed away. He, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's off the highway toward Midway. Yeah. Yeah. The last memory is Carlton, not Carl, well, Carlton too, I'm sure, but uh, McAllister um, in the 90s, maybe early 90s, there was a, a professionally oriented series in the Janet Wallace Fine Arts Center. This is really fun. Sally, you want to come up? So is David Moore. Yeah, come on up. Sally Roos. I remember uh, Jun Lun, Jun Lun Theater with Three Legged like Race, lots of great dance there and aerial stuff, possibilities. Minnesota Opera, which was where James Will Ballet started, and um, we developed space there, thinking we would be there for just a couple of years, and so we made a studio, and then um, we also performed in the, the big space downstairs, which is just opposite the lab, which is, was the Guthrie Lab, and now is a big home to to dance. Um, when we came here, they tried to sell us on Barney's Underground, <laughs> which is um, <laughs> really disgusting and like, um, <laughs> um, but was really, the challenge was trying to explain to the powers that be that no, we couldn't go uh, do a class or a rehearsal with only like eight feet of space, turn the corner, go down some stairs, and then have it be a couple more feet of space. Like we couldn't have an H-shaped <laughs> space. And the meeting was over. And then um, we performed in mega churches, which are sort of the weirdest places ever. We do them all in night visitors there. Um, Is there one in particular? Um, they're like in Eden Prairie, mostly. Okay. Eden Prairie, it's called Prairie something church. Oh. Um, in the Minnesota Institute of Art, the Pillsbury Theater, so not just the galleries <laughs> where you put out cigarettes, but actually the theater downstairs, I think it's called the Pillsbury Theater. Um, the Bottling Company, where maybe John works sometimes, that was a really fun place to dance and do, you need longer ropes to do aerial there, I found out. The McKnight Theater, which is now being called, being reopened. The Wiseman Theater, I mean the Wiseman Art Center. And then my th um, two of my last favorite places are um, performing outdoors at Eleanor Bell's mansion with our big blubber Marley that we used to carry to perform outdoors in her front lawn on Wayzata or something. And then my very favorite recent place is the American Swedish Institute. So it's really nice to dance in a castle. <laughs> All right, Judith, Jim wants to join. Do you want to come on up? A few more stories, and then we'll wrap up, and I'll tell you about the next in the series. I don't want to forget the Women's Club. In 1963, Merce Cunningham's World Dance Theater performed there, sponsored by Walker. I think you've been there. Um, <laughs> Shapiro and Smith. It's wonderful. And um, the Southern has only gotten sideways comments, but the Southern Theater has been a big space for dance. Uh, Jeff's 
Jeff Bartlett was one of our favorite lighting designers for dancers and as the executive director for many, many years, he really developed that space. And um, Lisa is sitting very quietly, but the Minnesota Dance Theater, a space that John didn't mention, was what is now the Cedar Cultural Center, but uh, Mrs. Holton developed that as a theater space. And Cedar Village Theater. And so that was a big West Bank uh, site also. And I just think that one of the important points to say is where dancers have vision, things happen, and that includes cleaning up and making neighborhoods exciting. Jim? Jim Lieberthal. Thank you. Um, a couple spaces that I remember, I'm not sure if people here remember. Did anybody mention Antiques, Minnesota? Oh, it's such an unusual place. It's still there. Antiques, Minnesota. It's still on the corner of Bloomington and uh, Lake. Yeah. Yeah. Antiques. Yeah. A N T I Q U E S. A N T I Q U E S. Uh, Minnesota. And um, it was kind of an unusual place because you go downstairs and negotiate rehearsal space upstairs in some very um, small rooms um, with the people in the antique shop. So I go down there and see just really strange objects. And I keep thinking, God, who buys these things? And how do, can they stay here? And how can they have space to rent and whatever? So it was really kind of interesting. Um, also performed over at the theater were the um, Plymouth um, churches been there, they have done numbers of different things. Yeah, how, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, yeah, thank you, <laughs> that's great, exactly. And I don't know if people remember that small space on the second floor when it was called Hennepin Center for the Arts, the Little Theater. Oh, I remember seeing James Sewell Ballet there. Yes, indeed, yes, it was great. So, and that's actually where they first saw the company. That's their first, first um, out, but anyway. So Sally's talking about the weight room at the Target Center. Um, Linda, you want to come up? Linda Shapiro. Uh, the Caravan Dance Collective was in St. Paul in the space that was originally the Nancy Hauser, one of the spaces Heidi talked about. And we used to perform at the Edith Bush Theater, which oh, was this little, kind of theater. little, yeah. Edith Bush Little Theater. I, Edith Bush. I Googled it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of this uh, timbered building <laughs> in St. Paul with a very old and, and sort of creaky. Um, and I also remember seeing um, Lucinda Childs and Robert Wilson in a performance uh, in, in, I think it must have been the 80s at the Edith Bush, when a woman got up and said, this is terrible, and walked out. <laughs> But, but I also want to give a shout out to places like Northrop, which has been glancingly mentioned, um, where Anda Hazi and uh, MDT performed the Nutcracker for quite a while at Northrop, um, and, and the Walker, these big spaces that mainly bring in companies from other places. How deeply these these things have influenced me as a dancer and choreographer, and I think many of us here, not just seeing the, um, these companies on stage, but also um, participating in classes and workshops that have been offered by the Walker. I mean, I still remember doing a workshop with the Grand Union and with Twyla Tharp in Sue Wiles' days at the Walker, and I know that Northrop has offered many classes in conjunction with companies that have come. And I think that's, those places are really important, plus the fact that Northrop presented to New Dance Ensemble, <laughs> and that was, that was really big for us. Um, and I just wanted to, as a kind of interesting little point, say that the first dance performance, dance performance at Northrop was in 1932, and it was the Mary Wigmann Company from Germany. <laughs> Great, yeah, come on up. Hi, I'm Linda Lee Soderstrom, and following on the Mary Wigmann comment, Margaret Dietz's studio at 725 Fourth Street, across from Ralph and Jerry's, choreogram, dance, company and school, Southeast. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that church was famous for having a plaid linoleum floor. <laughs> and um, after her death, then Bev Sonnen and Molly Lynn, help me out here, Instructional Dance Theater, Mary Lee Hardenberg, some others, all shared, co-shared that space as well for uh, about 10 years, till about the 80s. Oh, it fell down, it burnt down, <laughs> it fell down. Not David. Did anyone mention the O'Shaughnessy and the Walter Church? Uh, O'Shaughnessy. The O'Shaughnessy and then um, St. Paul Student Center. <laughs> St. Paul Student Center. The Fitzgerald. The old, the original Guthrie next to the Walker. The new Guthrie's McGuire Theater in the Dowling Studio. Okay, Pillsbury House. I'm wondering at the Soap Factory. Lake Harriet Bandstand. Suvac, slow down, slow down. Okay, so how about the last 10 comments? If you can come and see Kristen and just make sure she found a spot on the piece of paper. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up with letting you know about the next two in the series. So March 1st is uh, a series, is a lecture called Educational Outcomes. It's about dance in our schools. We have fabulous uh, pioneers, educational pioneers that have found ways to bring dance into our school systems, K through 12, college, and outside of that. So we'll have um, educators talking about their uh, innovative approaches to bringing more support to dance through that. And then May 31st is the last one in the series for this year, and it's developing dance. And it's all about the great protocols around talking around works in progress and um, developing language around uh, talking about dance as it's being developed and how we support our community through the creative process, not just with performances or with classes. And so those are the last two in the series. Um, I'm excited about developing the partnership even greater with the archives at the library and how we can make you know, some of the research we're doing to prepare for these and have that more visible and useful um, to anybody just perusing the internet. Uh, next Sunday, there's a free concert here in celebration of um, Dr. Goodale's life and there'll be dance performed as well as um, a concert. And any other shout outs anybody wants to give? This was a really exciting day and I really wanna thank you guys. So remember to come up and see Kristen if you said, if, if you said a, uh, yeah, if you said a space in the last five minutes, please check, thank you.